the Rosillo and Canal Podcast. It is Rosillo and Canal on a Monday, ESPN Radio, presented by Progressive Insurance. Danny Canal in for himself. I'm Matt Barry from Sports Center in for Ryan Rosillo. Uh, I heard that they gave Canal the steering wheel on Friday, was it? It was. And it mimicked someone driving and texting. Oh, look at you so coming they, in they, here. So, insulting so they the went, co-host. So they went to they 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 went low on the depth chart and they <laughs> they pulled me in uh, for the better part of the next three hours. Uh, excited to be here with you. And I appreciate you coming in. I do, because it's a lot of work to drive the show, as I found out Friday. Did you? Uh, so you were at Augusta. I see you wore your Augusta golf shirt. I, Rosillo was in Augusta. Did you guys hang out at all? No. Did you see he, him at all? Here's what Rosillo did with that. Okay. He knew that I was going to Augusta for, for work. Yeah. He knew that I knew that he was probably going to be there, so he threw out the way pre-Augusta invite. Yeah, bro, you should come hang out. You know, we got a house. Yeah. Right house. You, get, you know how many times I heard from him while I was in Augusta? Zero. Really? Zero. It's kind of messed up. In fact, I knew that I wasn't going to hear from him, so I lobbed it out to him. I just lobbed a text. Yeah. Hey, man, you were going to go to Snoop tonight. Snoop was there. Right. Which was awful. Oh, it was? It was awful. Wait a second. We can get into Snoop later. Okay, good. I'm so then sure I, I think I'm, I'm going to lob Rosillo the... Text to invite. see what he does to yeah. see if he's like, hey man, yeah, you should come over. Nothing, nothing. Hanging out here tonight. That was it. <laughs> That's no different. Than so there was no. Th- he didn't <laughs> reciprocate anything. That's kind of messed up. Yeah. Look, yeah. you know, what he was there. Do? I was there. The shirt looks good though. Thank you. I like I, you can tell there's the crease like right down <laughs> yes. the sides because I just got it out Fresh of the packaging. Out of the box. So I just wanted everyone to know because I can't wear this when I'm doing Sports Center. Right. So I figured this is right. just have half radio, half TV. So I figured I'd wear this today. Uh, for the beautiful people at home to know that I was at Augusta National. Perfect. Uh, also, on today's program, we've got a great show lined up. Marty Smith going to join us from Rome. Uh, he's there with Michigan football. Uh, they're gallivanting across Europe for spring ball. Brian Kelly, head coach of Notre Dame, joining us. Corey Davis, the receiver out of Western Michigan. It is draft week. We'll talk to Mel Kuyper Jr. But we want to start in the NBA, where another one of Canel's Bold proclamation just went to die. I believe you said when the Bulls were up two nothing, yes. that it was over. The Celtics were done. Okay. Now, what would happen? What would happen if if you said? And it's it's hard. I don't want to go with the Cavs because I don't want to say what happens if you guaranteed the Cavs would be in the finals and then LeBron got hurt because I don't think Rondo being out is the same equivalent as LeBron being off the Cavs. What if Bulls. Steph Curry got hurt off the Warriors and you were a guy that said, "Hey, he's going to be out," or well, a Kevin Durant hurt. Right, but I, I still I'm think they're the best that. team in the league. I do too. I still think they will win without him as well. But to be, this is my point: being with Rondo out has significantly changed the outlook of this series for the Bulls. Right, it and has. he had the, in the game two. He had the incredible game where he goes off. He's feeding around. He looks like vintage Rondo from before when he was, you know, playing with the Celtics, winning championships there. So we did, though, just to be full full disclosure, we knew on Friday. What would happen? We knew Rondo had been announced out. Mm -hmm. I was asked, hey, what do you think now of the series? I was not quite as bold saying it's over, but I ultimately thought the Bulls would still win. And I still think they will. What did you say? Uh, After game two, before Rondo was out, I'm like, they're toast. Put them to bed. Celtics are done. That sounds pretty definitive. Yes. And now with Rondo, when Rondo was out, I backed off that definition. So you're backing off. So you're not you. St- I'm still, but I stuck to my guns on Friday. Even when we knew Rondo was out, I stuck to it. I just wasn't as all in. Like, and if I was you, a betting man, I would have bet a hundred dollars on it, saying they were done oh, before. Big. Now I'd go like ten. Wow, big spender. <laughs> yeah. But do you still think the Bulls are going to win the series? I do because I feel, and this is some of Sarudi's intel. Mm. I feel like Rondo's going to come back, and I think that significantly changes the scope of the series again. Here, I'll tell you this. Not only am I willing to say that you're wrong about all of all of that, <laughs> okay. I'm also willing to say now that this thing is tied up at two apiece, it's over. <laughs> Except Boston's going to win. You're taking the complete. I'm other taking side. the complete opposite. So you're on freeze pops because freeze pops the only guy in here who was not deterred by anything. He had Celts in six the whole way. He's like no, no, doesn't even care. While I believe that Isaiah Thomas, he's obviously still mourning the loss of his sister. I believe that you cannot take that into enough account in the first couple of games because of the way he found out and the timing of which he found out. Mm -hmm. It appears to me that he has now learned how to channel his emotions to get himself within this series, and they have figured it out. Rondo's huge. With Rondo on offense for the Bulls, they move the ball around a lot better. 
Mm-hmm. They just don't. They don't look like they're in sync. Although they were up big, the other or the, they came back last night when Boston was up big. However, Boston is the one seed for a reason. The fact that they got rid of that two zero deficit in two consecutive games on the road and tied it at two apiece, I think this thing's over. Boston's going to advance. All right. I just hope Gerald Green keeps playing out of his mind the way he has yesterday. And, and Fred Hoiberg. <laughs> he's trying anything he can do. In fact, it's time for Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, half the cost. Here's Hoiberg after the game trying to explain why you can't guard Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas is a hell of a player, an unbelievable competitor. He's a warrior, everything he's going through right now. He had a hell of a game tonight. But when you're allowed to discontinue your dribble on every possession, he is impossible to guard. He's impossible to guard when you're able to put your hand underneath the ball and take two or three steps and put it back down. It's impossible uh, to guard him in those situations. That's weak. What was he trying to do there? Because there, there are I don't th- know. There were, theor- there were theories going around that this year radio studio that he was he was trying to take that data approach. No, the no. Fisdale approach getting his team. No, because if you're going to go that approach, which Fisdale did and did have a major impact on that series with Memphis coming back and tying it up at two two, you have to put some emotion into it, and there has to be a clear message sent. This is just sounds like a crybaby to me. With Hoiberg doing this, it sounds this is something you bring up in the off season. Like you send a video and say, "Hey, these are rules that we should start calling." No one gets called for traveling. No one gets called for carrying in the NBA. It just doesn't happen. And to complain in the spur of a moment, right after a loss, in which you just didn't look like you competed in the game, it's a bad look. By the way, I love that Isaiah Thomas fired back and, and said that that's not the reason why I'm unguardable. Right, <laughs> and he's probably right. I mean, yes, he does. He does like to have his handles that get a little bit loose sometimes, and he can carry And he's it. a but fiery if, player. But if you're going to play the game, it's the NBA. They let you get away with it. I just don't for, – for coaches to come out, one of my biggest pet peeves in sports is when coaches come out after a game, when they go to the podium, and they blame someone other than themselves. Officials, number one, is the number one thing. Don't Which cry you, about the officials unless they're – the only time you would do it is if there's a game-changing – call at the end of the game you want to do it there or if you're going to do it go all in the way Fisdale did like go all in where it's going to go viral you're probably going to get fined get your money's worth like it's a, like when a baseball manager gets kicked out of yes. a game throw don't bases. just get thrown out because you, you when you get thrown out get thrown out do the like, rosin bag state, grenade yes. or like do anything you can like yes. if you're going to go all in because you're going to get fined right and now you just look petulant exactly you got to show some emotion something your team can respond to so you are not willing, if I gave you some odds, mm-hmm. you're not willing to back off the Bulls? No. The simple fact that the our, Celtics come in on the road. Our analytics department has oh, we now some numbers the out. Celtics at 62% chance to win the series. So they're back all in on the Celtics. I'm staying on the Bulls. I'm just not as confident. Who, uh, and I'm really stubborn. Like That's probably the thing. It probably is not the smart play. But I'm very stubborn. Who cooked that? Was that basketball power? Who cooked yeah, the number five? One of those. I don't. I don't even. I don't love analytics, so I don't even like giving them credit where credit is due. I'll look it up to make sure that we don't. You know. So the number nerds took all the numbers. Yes. Swirled them in a bowl. Yes. Put them in the oven and cooked up 62 percent for the number one seed against the right. Eight. Which That's will change pretty again. Big. That thing will change, and guess what? It'll probably if the Celtics win, it'll go up to 80 percent. What do you have against analytics? Ah, uh, I love them. I love analytics. I don't think you do. No. I think they should be used um, after you watch film, after you watch the game. I think they should be used to complement other aspects of analyzing basketball. It shouldn't basketball, be the soul. Is it just basketball? No, no, no it's you... football more so than basketball because I know more about football, so I have a bigger problem when the FBI comes out and puts out certain numbers. You know what my biggest – dislike of analytics is in, in all of sports. And I would love, we have a researcher hanging around, just come in studio and sell me on this one. Yeah. As we've gone way off topic, which is fine. War. You don't like the wins, wins above, replacement? above replacement. That is the most meaningless number that you could cook up. And yet I think that's what Nate Silver calls his favorite stat. That's out there. That's all you need to know. <laughs> uh, coming up next, it's draft week. Mel Kuyper Jr. is going to be here to talk draft and, and, and some of the players. Miles Garrett, a lot of controversy around him, whether or not he should be the number one overall pick. But Mel Kuyper Jr. knows more about the draft than any of us combined. We're going to talk to him next here on Rosillo and Canal. It is Rosillo and Canal on a Monday. Straight talk wireless nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable networks. I'm Matt Barry in for Ryan Rosillo the next two days. Danny Canal is in for himself. It is draft week. 
it's one of the greatest weeks of the year, and I say this all the time about the NFL because there, there are people that, and they're rare, they have NFL fatigue. But then when the NFL decided to move the draft to Thursday primetime, it was one of the smartest decisions you can make because on the weekend, you know, it's still got good numbers, but who's watching? No brainer to move you're, you're, you're cutting primetime. your audience now, but Thursday yep. primetime ended up being a genius. Just another reason uh, the NFL has become a year round adventure, but it is also an excuse to get more Mel Kiper Jr. Yeah, you can't get enough Mel. And for me, Mel Kiper Jr. should work year round. Mel, <laughs> do you agree or oh. disagree? A lot of people would disagree with you on that, Matt. They've had enough of me by uh, Monday when the draft is being wrapped up. But, uh, hey, why not do a round of night? Start out the night with the first round and the second. Do one round per night uh, and then do it that way. It may come to that at some point. But it is great to have it on Thursday night and Friday night and then all Saturday afternoon in Philadelphia outside, which we've never done before. This is historical. Never had the draft. One day outside in Chicago. Remember, last couple of years was day three. Day one and two was inside. Now every day outside in Philadelphia. And my understanding is the weather is going to cooperate, which is great. Now, Kuiper, come draft week, you've, you've done all the preparation mm-hmm. leading up to this point. What's left for you to do now that it's draft week? You know, basically just tweak a couple things that happen late. Uh, you know, you always get that in terms of things that may be away off the field and how that impacts the player. We saw that over the weekend with Reuben Foster. See it, see it now with Caleb Brantley, defensive tackle, Florida. Uh, outside of that, then worry about the mock draft, mock number five that McShay and I will be working on uh, in the next couple of days. That'll be out the morning of the draft, our final mock of the year. Uh, and then I'll start as soon as the draft's over looking at next year's prospects. And Todd will as well. Todd has a mock for next year coming out like – next Monday, and that went, the following week is when I have my first big board for next year coming out. So you know, as soon as the draft's over, Monday, we kind of wrap it up, and we start thinking about 2018. Canell has never worked that hard in his life. Whoa, whoa, watch Ever. your mouth. Watch I mean, your he's, mouth. he's already on Six the next Six days year. a week, hold on. When I know McShay, it's not his favorite thing to do because right. he doesn't have quite the intel. How do you feel about your big board? Do you like doing it that early? Well, let me give you a little insight on McShay. McShay does that that 2000, <laughs> that next year mock, because he does not want any part of grading the team's dress. Right. So I'm left <laughs> to do that. He doesn't want any part. So he had to come up with something else to take its place. And he said, I'll do a mock for next year. So that's how that all unfolded years ago. And I'm stuck with putting out a grade on each team's draft. And we do that on, actually do that Sunday with our big draft review show on ESPN. And then obviously all day Monday uh, covering it as well. But, you know, Todd's looking ahead quick. And it's fun because I thought I look back at last year's and he had a lot of players are going to go in the first round in that first mock. So uh, hats off to Todd. Great job on that one. Mel, we're going to be joined later by Corey Davis, wide receiver. Mm-hmm. Receiver Western Michigan. I know there were a lot of people coming into the draft mm-hmm. that thought he was perhaps the best receiver of the lot. Right. He, of course, had the ankle injury, uh, didn't do any pre draft mm-hmm. workouts. Where do you see him now? Where do you have him going? Well, I picked him when Todd and I did our mock, GM mock, where we picked as if we were selecting for that team last week. I took him at 13 to Arizona. Now, 18 to Tennessee would make an awful lot of sense. Corey Davis is talented. I mean, he's almost 6'3", 210 with long arms, and he competes. I talked to P.J. Fleck. He had him on the Dari Mel show about a month and a half ago, two months ago, and we are talking about you know PJ, uh, to P.J. about Corey Davis, and he raved about his work ethic. And he's not this diva receiver, even though he wants to be the sharp-dressed guy coming into the draft, as the receivers do. Uh, he's all about working hard. And I think that's a big asset moving forward for Corey Davis. Now, what is, are the concerns? You mentioned the ankle, not running the 40. Seems like to have that information. Then the Mid-American Conference competition. Then the fact that he did have a, a, a catchable drop on routine balls that kind of bothered you a little bit. But I, I tell you, he competes hard. He, he, you talk about the first consensus All-American in Western Michigan school history. Uh, great stiff arm, great after the catch. He turns on that speed, he'll battle. Uh, like I said, he'll use that stiff arm very effectively to pick up extra yards after the catch. Uh, somebody's going to get a good one. Whether it will be great in the NFL, we'll see. But he's going to be a good receiver. He'll work hard. And I think he goes somewhere in the middle of the first round. People tune into the draft for different reasons. I think there's going to be mm-hmm. great storylines that unfold. People obviously invested in what their team is going to select. Mm-hmm. For you, what will be the thing you most look forward to? Like, what will the drama, where will that come from for you? Danny, it's about all the players because, you know, you, you want them to have destinations. And we all project these mocks and try to figure out where guys are going to go, where the best fits, what team needs this player. And then you finally see where they go. And is, is it a good fit? Why did they take this player over another player? Then you get all the, the questions and the, the evaluations. And I think it's just like Christmas morning. You know you're getting something. 
You hope you like it. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, but you're getting something. Teams are getting something. They're going to love all their gifts. How many gifts you got on Christmas Day? You said, I don't really like it. You like everything. Okay? And I think then you try it on and maybe it doesn't fit, right? Well, then you take it back. Well, you can't take back a pick, but it, sometimes it doesn't fit right. Sometimes it's not as good as you thought it would be. And that's after you get into the mini camps. And a lot of NFL players, Danny, and you know this as well as anybody, you were in the league. You guys knew pretty quick. When you saw a guy coming out of college into the NFL and there's many who can play and who can't play. So sometimes those judgments that you see, and I talked to a couple of chances about it. They said, oh, you knew when you made a mistake pretty quick. So that they have a pretty good handle by the time you get to training camp on who's in their plans and who may not be. Mel Kuyper Jr. joining us here on Rosillo and Canal. All guests on Rosillo and Canal appear via the Shell Pennzoil performance line. And Mel, we've talked about this on SportsCenter now for the better part of the last two, three months. I was at Mitchell Trubisky's Pro Day. I was at Deshaun Watson's Pro Day and the NFL Combine. So I've kind of been along this process with you. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, now that we're in the week of the draft, where is the quarterback market shaking out first? But second, why now do you believe Trubisky has taken the lead as perhaps the first overall quarterback take? Yeah, he's been up there with me, Matt, all along. I, I never wavered on Trubisky. I think, yeah, I said all along, yeah, wow, he's going to be the first quarterback taken. I said that months ago, and, and I said that during the season, that, that he had a pretty high grade, not an elite grade, but he was up there in the first round. That, yeah, he should go back. I mean, you can rate him as a guy who, who is, uh, has a first round grade. doesn't mean he has to come out. Uh, guys have been up there at the top of the board and have gone back for another year. Okay, Andrew Luck could have come out early. He didn't. Peyton Manning, numerous others. It benefits you tremendously to go back. Instead of 13 starts, he would have had 26 plus the senior bowl. And he would have come into that whole process with a different attitude. You're more maturity physically and mentally. Okay, Now you don't have that and you've got the fewest starts of any quarterback. Throw Cam Newton out. He had one at Blinn Junior College as well. Mark Sanchez had 16. Trubisky's got 13. That's the concern. He doesn't have a wow factor in terms of his physical ability either. He's, all, he's good enough in all those areas, but with another year of production on the field, then to go to the senior bowl and the combine with more of a swag and another year, like I say, of experience, feel a little bit better about everything, then you could have said, man, he's the guy. Right now, you're not saying that. There's other quarterbacks who have kind of pushed it up, but it looks like right now, Mitch Trubisky will be the first quarterback taken, will go in the top 10, and we'll see if only having 13 starts impacts him like it has a lot of other quarterbacks. You mentioned it right in the, one of your first answers about Caleb Brantley, the defensive tackle from mm-hmm. Florida. What type, and obviously he was uh, charged with misdemeanor battery after fighting with a woman. What Player, what type of player are we talking about here? You know, I talked about him on ESPN.com, Danny, after one of the games uh, you know, this past year where he looked like he could be a factor getting into the backfield wreaking havoc. Uh, it was quiet in some other games, but overall, a guy looked like a solid second, maybe a late first. I think after everything, you know, you got into the final evaluation, I gave him a second round grade. Now, all of a sudden, you have to wonder how far he drops down the board. So it's just these things that happen. You know, we have a long time between the end of the season and early April for things to happen with the combine. Look at Reuben Foster. I thought he was one of the best players in the draft. I still believe that, but he could drop. We're you know, basically not drop. He was projected to be a mid-first. He may go a little later than that. Who knows? But he's going to be a first-round pick. But these things, Danny, every year they seem to happen with a player or two that late in the process you have to try to tweak your evaluation a bit. Now, Kuiper, happy draft week. Do you have a hype song that you listen to before draft covers on Thursday night? No, I really don't. I really, you're, so, you're so focused on this process that you know, the music will wait till next week. Okay, good. All right. The post draft hype song from Mel Kuyper. Thank you, Mel. Enjoy the draft. Tune in it, to guys. Mike and Enjoy Mike it, live this Thursday and Friday from Philadelphia for the NFL draft, brought to you by DXL. DXL is the go to store for guys waist size 38 and up. DXL, you are looking good. Coming up next, Antonio Davis joins us in studio. He will decide who is right, Canel or me, plus Thunder and Rockets. That and more coming up next on Rosillo and Canal. I love that we're going to Oakland to Sacktown, the Bay Area, and back down. <laughs> what you know about that? Bristol's, oh! Bristol's where I throw my Mac down. Show me love. That very in for Ryan Rosillo here on Rosillo and Canal. Uh, coming up in just a bit, Brian Kelly, head coach Notre Dame, going to join us. I think I'm going to ask him about uh, Michigan and Rome and where he would take the fighting Irish. And we'll also have Marty Smith from Rome. Nice. Telephone international support. show today. Yeah, we are. We're going all international. Uh, but first, ESPN NBA analyst Antonio Davis joins us in the studio, giving us the Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, half the cost. 
Hello, AD. What's going on, How man? How you been? Oh, man. Just trying to get it in. Long day. Got to go get these reps in. Try to keep this weight off. That's all. <laughs> That's good. Just get, I love a guy Cardio. Just, just getting it in while at work. The full slate of NBA action yesterday. There's a, there's a million things I want to get to with you. All right. Uh, but I do want to start with the Celtics digging themselves out of that 2-0 hole to the Bulls. Yeah. As we sit here the Monday after, where does this series now stand in your mind? You know, I, I think, I think boss, like you said, Boston is game control. I think they're playing better each and every game. Um, I don't think the Bulls have enough, you know, talent and otherwise to match up with them for the next few games. I wouldn't be surprised if, if Boston won the next two and this thing is over. Uh, I'm sure Jimmy Butler has something to say about that, mm-hmm. but is he enough to overcome you know, uh, a Gerald Green having 18, you know, and, and get out of nowhere, you know, and, and then to deal with Isaiah in the fourth quarter. Uh, so we'll see what happens, but I, I'm pretty sure this one is over. What if Rondo comes back and he said, you know, what if his injury wasn't as bad as we thought and he's able to come back and get another the, game? This was going to, this, this series right here was going was one of my most intriguing series mm-hmm. because I felt like with those three guys with all that experience, Rondo going back to Boston, you know, D Wade wanting to prove he still got a little something in the tank, you know, Butler still trying to take that next step up to be a superstar, that they would give them a run. So I I, I knew I figured it would go five or six games. So I'm not surprised. Um, obviously, you throw in another element with what went on with Isaiah. Um, but this this is going this was a going to be a good series, and if he were to come back a game or two, you know it can still change. You know, but uh, although they had problems, Rondo was a guy to me, another playmaker that they needed. Sure. You can put him at point, put D Wade at point. Now, when you take guys off the floor, you still got a combination out there that can get stuff done. But now, I just don't see that happening. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here to say that the Rockets are going to go on and win their series with the Thunder. Even though Russell Westbrook has been fantastic, you can tell he's getting to the point now where he's just getting sick of the negativity around this team, went off on a reporter yesterday. But he had 35-14-14, and another triple-double. But as we look at this now, Antonio, with this Oklahoma City Thunder team, some of the narrative around them is that Russell wanted the team to be his. Mm. Is it now clear going into the offseason, which appears is right around the corner for the Thunder, that Westbrook has to understand that he needs more help? Yeah. I mean, and, and it's, you know, I think under the circumstances, they did a great job this year. You know, let's let's tip, tip our hats to them, you know, making the playoffs uh, after losing a phenomenal athlete and player and, and Kevin Durant. But I, I do feel like in order to win in this league, um, you need uh, help at the top and you need a great supporting cast. Mm-hmm. They have a great supporting cast. Now you're going to need another guy or two in there uh, so that when you when you are matched up one-on-one or you have it going, they can't double-team off you. They can't you know wreck havoc on your offense because they're just so focused on you and you're so predictable. Um, and and I, I think that'll happen. I, I don't know if they had a choice this year, but going into the summer, they, they've obviously made some great moves. OKC has been very good at getting the kind of guys they need to get, and I think they'll be right back there or in a better position going forward. In your mind, does it take a little bit away from what we saw out of Westbrook and his performance this year? I, to be fair, there are people that are saying, well, who else is there? I mean, is it in your yeah. mind? He had a historic season. Yes, he did. He did. But the, the one, and, and I don't want to say complaint, but if we were to pick out something you you felt was a little bit of a downturn was while Russell's doing his thing, everybody else is standing around watching. <laughs> How much rhythm yeah. can Adam get in? How much rhythm can Victor Oladipo get in if you're sitting around waiting for Russ to give you the ball? It's it it was it was understandably a great question. You just mentioned when Russ went off on the reporter. Mm-hmm. When he goes to the bench, productivity goes down. That's because he's just, you know, so in control of the ball and control of their offense, what happens good or bad. And I just think at time he's he's gonna have to empower other guys to have that confidence, to get that rhythm, so that when he's not on the floor or he's not playing well, he's shooting the ball bad or something like that, they can step up and, and kind of help him carry some of that load. 
There were a lot of question marks around the Cleveland Cavaliers the last couple months of the season. Yeah. It was up and down. It was ugly, losing record, all this, all the questions that we had. Now they come out, they sweep the Pacers 4-0. What did we learn? Do we have any answers now? Yes. You know, I'm so disappointed in my Pacers, man. I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, it's it's just seemingly such a mess over there. But um, I, I don't think that the Pacers gave us an opportunity to learn anything from the about the Cavs because there were just seemingly so many mental errors. For example, Paul George shooting a free throw. You know, Kevin Love take it out, shoot it full court. They laid a the ball up. Right. They teach you that in high school. That That's not something that should have ever happen in the pros. Nonetheless, a, a playoff game. So it just goes to show. And then let's even back up. The very first game, they come down to the end. They have a chance to win. They they call timeout knowing that Paul George may be trapped. And what you come up with is giving him the ball at the top of the key. I mean, there's just something not right there. And until they fix it, until they get an identity, until Paul George for sure wants to stay there and they yep. want him there, I don't think they have a chance to be good at all. I've got you for 10 and 10 a night if you come out of retirement for the Pacers. Man, if I fair? can do that, I wouldn't be sitting here. You <laughs> hey, know uh, what's going on in the We all be <laughs> all be going back. As, as we look to the uh, Golden State Warriors, their uh, yeah. outcome against the Blazers, not mm-hmm. in question. They're up in that Series 3-0. But the, the story yeah. now, Steve Kerr, uh, we don't know when he's going to be back. Mike Brown is going to coach yeah. uh, Game 4. I don't want to take anything away from Steve Kerr. Right. But also Mike Brown is an experienced head coach. How yes. much do they really lose the Warriors by not having Steve Kerr on the bench for them? You know, with any situation, you know, if there's change, you know, there, there's going to be a little bump in the road. They're going to have to make some adjustments. You know, I equate it to if you and I were, were going to go to, you know, down the street to a restaurant. Mm-hmm. You may go a different way. I may go a different way. But sooner or later, we're going to get there. We're both going to be there. I think the Golden State Warriors will get where they want to go, back to the finals and have a chance to win it. Uh, I just think it'll, it'll, it'll happen a little bit differently. Uh, the question, the biggest question I have is, can Mike Brown get in those situations, game five, game six against San Antonio or whoever it is, draw up that play, put guys in a position and they deliver? And we're going to see that if, if Coach Kerr doesn't come back, we're going to see him in that position. And will he be successful in it or not will determine whether or not he does. Well, LeBron's not there to chase him away. Well, LeBron's not there. And if they get to that situation, you know, I'm sure they'll be prepared for that one, too. All right, we're going to let you uh, get go get your leg day in. Appreciate it's it. Cardio day, leg day. How did you know day? that, man? A little cardio, a little legs. <laughs> yeah, you know, there are hard challenges. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> go <laughs> get the workout. It's, <laughs> it's tough. Antonio it's Davis tough. joining us here. If you like that interview and the rest of the show, we're still on Canal reminding you that you can listen to all three hours of this show on your phone on your ESPN app. Coming up next, Danny had a task on Friday. How did that go over at home? Mrs. Cannell perhaps the greatest consultant in media history, gave him advice. That's next on Rosillo and Canal. Wow. ESPN Radio presented by Progressive Insurance. More independent agents sell Progressive Insurance than any other brand. Find an agent at Progressive.com. Now that's Progressive. Matt Barry in for Rosillo today on Rosillo and Canal. Now Rosillo's obviously out. He's out today, tomorrow. All I week. Think, I think he's out, he's out all week. Okay. Yeah. So he was also out on Good Friday. Is well that correct? Deserved. Yeah. He was out on Friday. He was out on Friday, when? and we had Will Kane in. Okay. And Will has driven for radio before. And when I say driven, for the people who don't know, you kind of take the reins, right? You have to drive the show. You have to bring us in and out of break. you got to do all the talking, all the ads. You just It's a lot more work, right? The role that I'm playing. Yes, so exactly. I, yes, the role that you're playing. Okay. Right. Bringing us in and out, which I have... I've always been very appreciative of what Priscilla does. I've been appreciative for, any, for what you're doing today. Thank you, Danny. But uh, you don't really fully appreciate until you do it. So on Friday, I got home from work, and I was a little more tired than usual. I was like, man, I'm just kind of tired. So I said something to my wife. I said, you know, I'm tired. And she said, why? And I said, oh, I, I said I had to drive today. And she looked at me, and she said, oh, do you think you're good at that? <laughs> <laughs> and... You know Which, exactly what it means. Like, I, in a way, it's her saying, you were awful. It was a bad listen. I disagree. But let me hear what you think. She was it's literally the, seeking your feedback. 
<laughs> I totally so, disagree. Danny, do you think you're because good at that? Because she would be free, like she would say, you did a really good job, or yeah, that was new and unique for you. She could have even done like Saruti did, because I think he was kind of feeling the same way, but he said, yeah, all you need is more reps, which is basically saying you were awful the same way. Did you realize, do, do, do you agree with Mrs. Canal, who I love, by the way. I think she, I know she's I'm great. not good. I'm not a driver. I am not a driver, and I don't really have any aspiration to be. Because okay. I, I just think I'm I'm better off in the role that I play. Can I speak with Michelle Cerruti yeah. on this topic for a minute? With with Canal's wife berating him when he gets over <laughs> being bad at his job. At any point during this program on Friday, did you think that it was going bad, <laughs> Michelle? No. <laughs> oh, yes, wow. yes. She that thought it was, I was exactly. going to say at the beginning, Insulting. you know, he's not used to it, so it takes a while to get your feet wet. <laughs> okay, during the warm up, Saruti, did it get better? It definitely got better. Initially, you didn't say what show was on, um, and then Michelle was like, "Hey, tell them you're listening to Rosillo and Canal." You did that for real, a hundred percent honesty. I did that on purpose. I don't like when you come back every time and you say, hey, this is Russell and Canal. I like to keep them guessing for about 30 seconds, have a little banter, then come back to it. Oh, I know that's look at not you like, trying to Look at, look at you trying boat. to change that's radio. Too much. But, but at any point, where, did we not think of making a move mid-show and be like, you know what? <laughs> Let's get Will Kane to take Kane, over. Kane, you're in. No, it wasn't Canal. that bad. Well, let me, I'll, I'll let you be the judge because okay. we actually have a couple examples from Friday's show. You decide how bad they were. Oh, this is fun. And um, So we're basically, what we do a lot of times in radio is we'll have listening sessions when we have to listen back, which can be painful. We do similar in TV. So, we watch so game we're going to do that for you right now. We're going to listen back to some of Friday's show okay. and see what you think. So this is, this is a little trickier part of the logistics of driving a show. This is getting out. Levitard has a fun time with this with the hard outs, network hard out. This was the first network hard out on Friday. Okay. Do we have 10 seconds? Yeah, that's spots? it. And there's big for news. Facials? There's big news affecting the Celtics. I can't do Bulls a facial series. in 10 seconds for you. Is Rondo going to be able to play? We're going to tell you next. It's all- I thought I did all right. Considering my fill-in co-host that day, Will Kane, sure. was talking right through it. Like, he was just bam. So no, now you're throwing no the other alert, guy into no, the bus. He was not paying attention to the clock at all. He was going to get in his two cents, which I'm fine with. Just all I needed was... Three seconds to get a little tease in there because I'm a I'm a big teaser. You want to get the tease, right? Bring them back, suck them in. So now you're blaming everybody else. <laughs> yes. I will tell you that wasn't awful, but it wasn't great. Well, it was bad because we were talking over each other. The yes. actual toss wasn't that bad. This one, on the other hand, so this is exhaustion time. This is fourth quarter when you're holding up the four fingers in the air and you have you're, to finish strong. It's radio, dude. <laughs> you're sitting here talking. How exhausting right. can it be? Well, it does get a little bit All more right. challenging, as you might be able to tell Go here. This is the end of Friday's show. Hey, man, it's been a lot of fun. Good to see you again, buddy. You too. We'll have to do it again soon. I, uh, I'm i exhausted because I've been talking for three hours. Because you've I'm been driving. It made stuff. Danny drive. It's like you whole- have to get in shape for this job. So I have a whole new appreciation for Silla and what he does. Uh, he's Will Kane. I'm Danny Cannell. This has been Rosillo and Cannell for the past three hours. Coming up next, you can listen to Bo- Bomani Jones. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it almost sounded like you weren't sure if English was your first language. <laughs> oh, like you that's were worse than saying, you, "Are you? You, were, you, you were, think you're good at that? You were un- worse. You were unsure of what you wanted to say. Well, yeah, because I want to tease." And Michelle did a fantastic job putting teas in there. She's great. The only thing that was up there said Bomani Jones is next, which is really all you need to tease because you still go Bomani Jones is. I was coming up next, Bomani Jones. That's all you need to say. I was gonna have like a little pithy little comment in there that was gonna be kind of cute and fun, but I was like, in better judgment, I should just get to the get to the dang teas. And then there was extra time, so you have to fill it. So I'm like, yeah, that's been us for three hours. I, w- I want to get back to the, the Canal House. Oh yeah. Quick. How did how did that end? Like, did you? Well, I wanted to come back at her and say, do you think those jeans look good on you? (laughs) After she said to me, do you think you're good at that driving thing? But I was smart enough to realize because we've been married for 12 years. Yeah. That's a mistake I've already made before. I don't want to go there. But you realize by saying it now, you just said it. She doesn't listen. She she, Obviously, she only listens to the end of the show. Michelle, put that part on the the podcast. (laughs) Put that. She only listens to the end of the breaks. Put that out of the podcast, and for the uh, radio bosses that may or may not be listening today, you are doing a great job driving. By the way, don't ever put that combo together again that you did on Friday. <laughs> Coming up That's next, Warren Sapp says Miles Garrett is lazy. Should he be the number one pick in the upcoming NFL draft? You decide next on Rosillo and Canal.